Do you think that miracles are a thing of the past? Well, stay tuned to meet a man who will share the story of God's miraculous interventions in his life. My name is Yvonne Lewis Shelton. And I'm Jason Bradley, and you're watching Urban Report. Welcome to Urban Report. I'm your host, Yvonne Lewis Shelton, and I'm pleased to have as my co-host, my son, the general manager of Dare to Dream Network, Jason Bradley. Yay! It's good to be here with you. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's so good to be with you, Jay, and to have our special guest mm -hmm. here, Laren Cole. He is an author, speaker, and director of Desire Media. Welcome to Urban Report, Thank Laren. You, Thank you very much, Jason. Good to be here. Good to have you. Excited to be on Urban Report. Yeah. It's my first time on Dare to Dream, so. Yeah. We run into each Dare. other at a lot of events. We do. <laughs> ASI, GYC. Those are highlights for me when I yes. run into Jason. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Well, we're really glad to have you because we've talked to you over the past few years and we haven't had a chance to talk to you on Dare to Dream. Yeah. And you have such amazing testimonies. I mean, you have mm -hmm. more than one miracle that's happened in yeah. your life. And so we want to just kind of share with our viewers your journey. Yeah. So let's talk about your journey. Where were you born? I was born in Riverside, California. Oh, okay. I'm a California native. Did, were you raised in a Christian home? What was your home like as a child? Our home was a, a Christian home, uh, an Adventist home. The only thing I really knew about our, our, um, our religion really was that we went to church on a funny day. Uh -huh. and we didn't eat pork. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. other than that, that, was, that sort of defined my, my early childhood. I knew that was my religion. And, um, we have a picture of your family. Um, yes. And I think they put it up before, but let's, let's take a look at it so you yeah. can tell us who's who. Okay, there's a big tall guy. That's my good looking dad who's now deceased. Uh -huh. He had Parkinson's. He died in uh, 2012 or 11. 11. And right in the, on, the, on the one side is my mother, and the funny looking person in front is myself, <laughs> with sunglasses. So I was really cool, wasn't I? And, and then in the middle, that's my sister, my older sister. So that was our family, and that's a picture of us in Bakersfield, hmm. California. And um, mom is deceased also. She Aww. had cancer, age 56. Aww. And so, and. Uh, so we're kind of orphaned. Yeah, and, uh, it's a strange feeling yeah. not having. Uh, my parents have predeceased me, and I, and mm -hmm. I'm. Um, it's weird. It's just a weird yeah. feeling with your parents gone. Yeah, when my mother died, uh, it was the it was the first real close person that ever I had that ever died on me, and uh, it was just devastating. I mean, yeah. it was really hard to cope with. How old were you when she died? I was probably 29, 30 ish, somewhere mm -hmm. in there. Wow. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. How did that make you feel at that particular time, being so young, 29 oh, or 30, man. I can't well, imagine. Yeah, she had cancer, so yeah, she battled cancer for a while and uh, for two years, and so yeah, that just, I have never experienced uh, a close person dying. You know, I, a lot of people died. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I was in seventh grade, my, one of my best friends died, you know, but mm -hmm. he, was, he wasn't close like my mother, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, it was just, that's hard. I mean, yeah. it's devastating. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and she was so young, you know, she's beautiful. Yeah. You know, she was a beautiful woman and just a wonderful person. Yeah. What, what kind of impact did that have on your faith at that well, time? Well, at that time, I, was, I had drifted away from my belief in God. I, I don't know if you'd call me an atheist. You know, I, I, meet a, I know atheists now, and mm -hmm. atheists are more people who are, I would say they're generally angry at God. They believe in God, but they say they're atheists. I think they're most, for the most part, they're angry with God. So that wasn't me, really. I had, but I had drifted away from God, spent no time with God. My, you know, I kind of drifted away from my early childhood upbringing and uh, drifted into the world. And um, because of my lifestyle and things like that, I had no time to spend with God. And so I drifted away from my belief in God. Mm -hmm. And I would call myself more of an agnostic mm -hmm. at that point. And so when she... Her death, and we'll get into this, I guess, a little bit later, but her death is a, a catalyst that sort of mm. God used mm. in a powerful way to bring me back mm -hmm. to God, to my mm -hmm. belief in God. So, 
yeah, so it was a blessing, uh, other than it was very tragic. Yes, oh yes. So when, when you, growing up, you had your family. You had your dad, your mom, you had an intact family growing up. Yeah, we did. And then, and you grew up in kind of a nominal Christian environment. So what happened in your life that began to pull you even further away from God? Mm. Well, uh, you see, my dad, he, he was, he became an Adventist to, to marry with, you know, before he married, when he met my mother, she kind of helped convert him and, and, um, uh, and she was already grown up in the church. She grew up, she went to La Sierra University. Mm, mm -hmm. She knew Del Delker. Okay. She was a real Adventist. You know, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, um, La Sierra and... Uh, so, well, I would say what happened. So, we, you know, we, we grew up and we, my, mom, my mom and dad sent me to public school. That, that um, nothing against public school. I had a good education, but uh, it's not the most conducive for spiritual upbringing. Mm -hmm. To keep you close to God, it, it's not the no. place to be, really. No. I mean, I'm sorry, many of us have to go to, to public yeah. school. And uh, yeah. we were very poor growing up. And so um, my dad... Um, he started out extremely poor. He, he grew up in Yuma, Arizona, in, in that area, in the deserts, and, 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 and he was very, very poor. But when he met my mom, he got into farming, and, and he just worked his way up from being poor to being a millionaire. He became mm. very wealthy, wow. and uh, we were used to hard work. He was a farmer, you know, a ranch, uh, not a rancher, but a farmer, commercial farming in the southern San Joaquin Valley. <laughs> in, near the Bakersfield area, so. You know, it's it interesting, I, excuse me one second, but it's like when you think of farmers, you don't think of wealth. Yeah. Necessarily, yeah. and that's my, that's my ignorance. Yeah. I mean, I well, just, you know, out you know here, I don't think of wealth. We're driving around in the, in the cornfields of uh, southern yeah. Illinois here, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and it looks like, you know, the guy with the suspenders on and the, and the overalls and yeah. the corn hat or the straw hat. You, you think of that when you're kind of running out these little farms. This is commercial farming, high-tech equipment, you know, airplanes. Yeah, and, yeah. And he's in the southern San Joaquin. This is the breadbasket of the world in yeah. San Joaquin Valley. But uh, so we had about a thousand acres, and my dad just wow. wow. You know, he built. He worked so hard. So he worked his way up, basically, mm. from but from poverty to wealth. And see, that's. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is dare to dream. That is. So, that is a dare to dream. So story. we we want to mm. know more about. Um, oh, he he what was he, did. he was so poor. I mean, he told me of stories where he had to go out in the desert and shoot a jackrabbit just to find some food. So, um, yeah, he was really driven and um, and worked really hard. Um, How did he get his first? Where did the first well, opportunity come his from? His opportunities came with my mother's uh, father, which is, he was a farmer, and he mm -hmm. sort of uh, pioneered this area in the southern San Joaquin Valley. He partnered with Southern Pacific Railroad, which, mm -hmm. which was leasing out these sections of land. And so my dad, since he married into the family, he got the opportunity to work for grandpa. And, uh, and he tried to work his way into a partnership. My grandpa was really reluctant to that. So what happened, my dad just sort of went off on his own for a mm. while. And then he was successful there. So my grandpa instantly brought him back in. And, <laughs> Let's partner, you know, now we're ready right, to partner. Right, 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 right. So, and he was just, a, he was a good partner. And if mm -hmm. you wanted a good partner, my dad was a good partner because mm -hmm. he'll put in long, long hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so he worked, you know, he partnered with banks. The banks were, were always big financing uh, part of the of farming, commercial farming, it's a bank. Mm -hmm. My dad, I remember going with him to meetings in the bank where they'd meet and talk about these big numbers where they're going to borrow all the money. It was, mm. So they borrow money and they farm and, and it's high risk and um, high reward. But mm. you can have some pretty big losses too, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So how did your dad's work ethic impact you? Well, it's, it was good because we, we spent, uh, I, I learned how to put in long hours, you know, I don't know if that was good. I guess that was good. Yeah. But we, you know, he paid us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was very minimum kind of wage, but uh, it was actually before they had a minimum wage. As, as I remember the minimum wage coming in and all these labor laws coming in back in those days. And, and he didn't really like that very much, but uh, yeah. So, but the only downside was it instilled a love of money, I mm. think, for, mm. for me. You mm -hmm. know, I had this in a desire to um, be wealthy and... Um, and the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. And I found out that is kind of true because it's not really the love of money, it's the desire to be wealthy. I mm -hmm. think that would be a better translation. The desire to be wealthy can lead you into all kinds of, of evil. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was there. Where did it lead you? Well, my, my mother, on the other hand, just a godly, pure, you know, 
saint of a lady. I'm surprised she got hooked up with my father, but she did, and, and that was ordained. <laughs> she got a tie on him and cleaned him up quite a bit, and uh, um, she, was, uh, she had good intentions for us, but like I said, we were in public school, and we learned all kinds of things there, you know, um, you know, out fighting, and like I mentioned, one of my f best friends in the seventh grade, he was stabbed and shot in a oh. family feud, and I ended up being a pallbearer mm -hmm. in his funeral. But we learned things like, you know, just stealing and, you know, just, just things that Christians should not be, you know, doing. Mm -hmm. um, but one day, my mother, thinking to do a, a good thing for us, she brought home a Christian record. Seems harmless enough. It was a well-known um, uh, Christian group at the time, like around the 1970 era. Um, and if I mention the name, which I won't, uh, everybody would recognize the group. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, they didn't have uh, contemporary Christian music back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this might have qualified for that. But, so she, she brought this album home, and uh, we were playing it. And uh, nine out of the ten songs were good Christian songs, folk, you know, the, the traditional sacred music songs, but there was one song on there that had a sort of a, a rock and roll kind of a, a rhythm mm -hmm. in the back, which is kind of new for that kind of time. The Christian mm -hmm. rock was kind of, you know, that was kind of almost unheard of. Yes. Mm -hmm. But so when I heard that one song, you know, I had not been exposed to that. And it's sort of, you know how rock music is, uh, it's kind of charming and it's, uh, it's kind of gets, to, it, it got to me, it charmed me and mm -hmm. I thought, so I listened to that song over and over again, you know, I thought this mm -hmm. is kind of cool, what is, you know, it makes you feel kind of, makes me kind of get up and move a little bit and I, I thought, so I'd play that song over and over and my mom kind of noticed that and so since she sort of for, forbade this to listen to that record, mm -hmm. you know, back in those days parents could, could tell their their children that rock and roll is bad, yeah. <laughs> but they couldn't tell us why it was bad. I remember that and being confused by that a little bit. Mm, uh -huh. But uh, so that seed was planted in me, and, and uh, it kind of grew. You know, I, I I got out and watered it every once in a while, and so. Were you a musician, a singer? No, not at all at the time. But um, I I took every opportunity to hear that kind of music. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. In public school, the, I remember one day the uh, public school uh, bus they installed a radio on it. I mean, a radio, that probably wasn't a good idea for the kids, but we'd all want the, to, the bus driver to tune into the rock and roll station. Mm -hmm. So here, I'm listening to this, and I'm really, enjoy, I, I, I can feel the rhythms there, how they kind of influence your thinking, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And so I really got into this. And uh, as the years went by, I, I developed a taste for this, and I started to take, I took drum lessons, two years mm -hmm. of percussion drum lessons, and... Um, I decided one day, uh, under the prompting of a friend of mine up in, uh, when I had moved out, that I decided I want to be in the rock music business. You know, crazy, crazy thing to think of, but, uh, but so um, I uh, found another friend, a friend of mine, uh, his name was Greg, um, and he had a similar uh, aspiration, a goal in life. He, he wanted to be in the rock music business. Here's a picture of Greg on the right. Uh, I'm the guy with the hat, the funny looking guy with the hat on there. <laughs> Greg was a concert pianist, and he was the most talented musician I think I've ever, I mean, he could play anything. Mm -hmm. So he was a really good asset. We got together, and for some reason, I don't know what was wrong with, with youth's brain, we thought we were the most, we were the most talented, we were the greatest <laughs> musicians. <laughs> now, what were, you, were you playing drums at the time? I was playing, yeah, I was the drums. percussionist okay. and, and the lead singer, okay. if you can believe that. Oh. Our, our, uh, we, so we got together, we formed this two-person what we would call a band, mm -hmm. new wave rock music kind of thing, and um, and I was the singer, and uh, there was a picture of us. Um, well, I'll get to that in a second, but uh, we we um, well, we actually managed to get a manager. A manager picked us up and got us, introduced us to people, mm -hmm. and our manager one day managed to get us a recording contract in uh, North Hollywood with a t uh, producer. It's actually a production contract with a guy named Hank Donig. And I, I tried to find Hank. I can't find this guy for the life of me. But uh, um, he, pre he uh, presented us a contract. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we spent a lot of time, Greg and I, we spent a lot of time putting together a demo. And, you know, I, looking back, you know, it's just ridiculous. But it was actually pretty <laughs> decent. Um, it was a decent, what you would call a demo for that back in those days. It was just two of you? Just the two of us, yeah. So okay. piano and drums. And well, no, well, yeah, we, we, we had multi-track equipment. Uh -huh. I mean, we were, oh, so this gotcha. is recording. We had a recording gotcha. studio. We, um, uh -huh. we, uh, we lived on my father's 
ranch and on a pink mobile home <laughs> with an expando area. <laughs> and we were just sort of hole up in there, you know, like uh, some bandits in there. We kind of got in there and we would only come out just enough to work a little bit, as little as we had to, yeah. to get some money for food uh -huh. and music equipment. Wow. So we, we did, we spent all we had nice. on this ambition. So were you immersing yourself in the culture of rock and roll as well? Yeah, a little bit, but we were more immersing ourselves in our demo. Our, our, our whole goal was to get a demo because we knew, I knew he had talent and he, for some reason he had faith in my talent, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and if you want to call that singing, you know, uh, you, could, you could say <laughs> we, we had faith in each other and we, we, we just knew we were going to go somewhere, you know. And we're where were you spiritually at this point? Well, I, you know, I had forgotten God, basically, you know, but I, was, I wasn't thinking about my spirituality, you know, no church, you mm -hmm. know. I'm on my own. I don't have to go to church, you know. Mm -hmm. How old were you? This would be early 20s. Okay. Yeah, early mm -hmm. 20s. My parents did, did their job when I was out of the nest, and it was, but here I am living on my father's property, and so, and here we are building our studio and um, Building our demo, I remember we, we, we'd buy equipment. I bought my um, reel-to-reel. We, back in those days, we didn't have digital recording wow. So we got a reel-to-reel multi-track recorder. I bought wow. it from the guy who produced uh, the, the commercial, Milk Does a Body Good. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Mm. Milk Does a Body Good, yeah. which mm -hmm. is not true, really. <laughs> another story. <laughs> That's another, yeah, it's yeah. another conversation. Yeah. But anyway, bought that reel-to-reel -reel from him. We would go to, there was a picture up there of West L.A. Music which is the music store of the stars. So we would meet people there, got mm. our drums there, I got microphones, we would, when we had a little bit of money, that's where we're going. We go there and we build our studio. Okay. Finally, we had the demo done. And, uh, and then our, we've got a manager. Can you believe that? You know, people believed in us. Oh yeah, and Satan yeah. sends these people along to help us out, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. If we're not on the right track, the, the devil is right there to lead us. Yes, he is. And, um, so we got this recording contract. Uh, Hank Downing produced us. He liked it. You know, he says, I'll take it. And, and he had the recording contract. My manager had a meeting with us. He had the contract out there. Boys, all you got to do is sign on the, you know, this is like this typical movie you'd see. Sign on the line and you're in business. Boy, we're going to Capitol Records right over the hill. And, and uh, we got a little skeptical. You know, I thought that was uh -huh. too easy. Uh -huh. And before I'm glad you, the Lord did that. Before you signed, you mean? We you didn't got... sign it. Okay. We, um, we thought, let's think about it. Mm -hmm. And it was a, uh, you saw the picture of Studio Boulevard, and that, this is where a lot of, yeah, see on the left there, mm -hmm. Studio Boulevard, we went down from Hank Downing's upstairs uh, little studio there, and we went across the street, there were studios everywhere out down there in Studio Boulevard. So we just went over there, and there we found this studio right across the street, we thought, we're going to check Hank out a little bit, maybe, uh, maybe see we, a little bit more about this guy, as we're thinking about it, and so the studio right across the street had some security, we managed somehow to get into the studio, and we met the producer there. He was the producer for Kim Carnes mm. and uh, I think Linda Ronstadt and Neil Young. Wow. Jason, you know who Neil Young is? I don't. Good for you. I don't. <laughs> but you do, right? <laughs> I know Linda Ronstadt. Okay, I Linda know, Ronstadt. And Kim Carnes. You probably know them personally, right? No, 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 no. no, no. I, I had never met them, but I know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, so we go, hey, we're probably, this is, this is better than Hank Donning over there. He had a few uh, names, but... Uh, he didn't have Linda Ronstadt, you know. Right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we, we said, uh, hey, we, do you know anything about the guy across the street there? Is it Hank Donig? And he goes, yeah, I know Hank. Um, I said, we, well, we're, we've got a contract with him, and we were wondering if you, we were looking for a recommendation. And he said, um, well, he said, uh, I know Hank. I, I don't think, he said, I don't think Hank is the right guy for you, really. I mean, I, he's a nice man, but. He said, we might be able to take a look at your demo and, um, and, and take a look at it if you, if you have one. Uh, we'll take a look at it, you know, because we kind of looked the part at the mm -hmm, time. You know, we mm -hmm. had the, the look, you know, it, mm -hmm. might, it might sell. Those guys could, you know, uh, yeah, goofy yeah. as they look, they could probably sell something. Well, especially <laughs> my partner there. I was a goof off, so I... I <laughs> But uh, um, so you guys I, were kind of shopping around a little bit. Well, we weren't trying, until then. Yeah. yeah. As soon as we had the, it was too that. easy to get that contract. We thought, well, maybe that was too easy. So, uh -huh, uh -huh. so we came back and told Hank, we'll, we'll, we'll think about it. And so we left my manager there. We left Hank there and we went home. And for some reason, we started to get into trouble, it, it, mischief hmm. and, and even crime. I'm, I'm sorry to report, but uh, just for the thrill of it, we would do things that were wrong, um, mm -hmm. just to impress each other maybe, I'm not sure why, but uh, mm -hmm. um, one thing led to another, and I eventually, we, our, our, our group broke up, and um, I was arrested one day for mm -hmm. Grand Theft Auto, mm -hmm. and I found myself in court, in court, 
facing some very serious charges, hmm. uh, one of which was Grand Theft Auto. Uh, the other three charges were, well, lying to a police officer, receiving mm -hmm. stolen goods, selling stolen goods. You know, we had been doing things like that. And, um, and um, so here I am, I'm in court one day. Uh, this, I had already lied to my attorney about what happened, you know, mm -hmm. I, and I'm at my arraignment. You know what arraignment is mm -hmm. in court? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you stand before a judge, you plead guilty or not guilty. Well, that's the first step in a trial. I pled not guilty, even though I really was guilty. Mm. And um, um, I remember on court day, when it was time to go to court, uh, just before the court session started, I showed up. You know, I hadn't slept that night before at all. I'm, I am stressed out more than I've ever been stressed out in my life. I mean, this is stress. Because yeah, I had a yeah, lie yeah. prepared, you know. Yeah. The Bible says, I think in Isaiah 40, there's no peace for the wicked. That's mm -hmm. right. For the lawless person, and that's me. And I had no, I had, I, I didn't know a, a person could experience so much stress, you know. Mm -hmm. And so here it is, didn't sleep at all hardly the night before. I get to court, nervous as can be. They put me in a little waiting room in um, uh, uh, a waiting area before where the defendants go before they go on to the, into the court scene. So I'm all by myself in there and waiting and waiting, stressing and sweating it out and, you know, and thinking, trying to rehearse my lie, you know, get just mm -hmm. a, and that is not a comfortable feeling. Well, my uh, attorney came in, the court appointed attorney came into the, the room and he says, he sat down across the table from me with a real serious look on his face and he said, Laren, the court wants to make a deal with you. Mm. He says, and they call, he says, uh, it's a plea bargain. You ever heard of a plea bargain? Mm -hmm. He says, um, if you will change your plea to guilty, the court will significantly reduce your sentence. And instead of spending 10 years in jail, if you're found guilty, you'll only spend two years in jail. Mm -hmm. And that two years can be spent on a work release program in 45 days. Mm. Wow. So they're really twisting my arm here. I mean, I, yeah. I was ready to go in there and, and uh, you know, do the thing I had planned to do, which was not a good thing. But he, he, he left me. He, he, he told me about the plea bargain, and then he left me to think it over. Mm. So I'm sitting there thinking it over. Man, what do I do? I'm thinking, 10, year, 10 years? Are you serious? Mm -hmm. yeah, they're looking at 10 years. Because mm -hmm. it was grand theft? Grand theft auto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. not a good thing. Yeah, It doesn't yeah. sound good. Grand. Grand, yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> if you plead guilty and you accept that charge, that's with you for the rest of your life. Unless you, I don't even know if you can get that expunged or your record. I don't know. That or not. But yeah, I hope it's expunged by now. <laughs> 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 because um, so I, what I did, I, I, I thought it over. And uh, when he finally came back in, I said, oh, you know, I broke. I said, I'll take it. I'll take the deal. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you know, the court doesn't actually have to. I guess the court recommends that or the prosecution recommends that to the judge. Mm -hmm. And there's no telling what the judge is going to do. Right. With that. Uh, you, right. The judge yeah. could. But but uh, I guess tradition says that he follows the pro prosecution's. Um, recommendations, and I'm going. I hope. Mm -hmm. I hope they do. And so we changed our plea. I never got to go into the courtroom. Uh, I changed my plea to guilty, and I took the pro, the, the 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 deal, the mm -hmm. plea bargain. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, oh mercy, mercy! The, the court held up their end of the bargain, and I was sentenced to 45 days on a work release program. Wow! Which means I didn't have to go to jail. I had to report to jail at first mm -hmm. and sign up for the work release program, but then I was released. Yeah. I spent 45 days working on a, um, a, parks, a city parks program where I work with these people. For four, I just check in in the morning. I'm their prisoner for all day. I'm their slave. Mm -hmm. and I worked all day for f just 45 days. And so, wow. and so, and I call my, you know, I call my story pleading guilty. And the reason I call it pleading guilty is because, this is a, a marquee of my, my testimony, but mm. uh, um, this this whole situation reminds me, and so it works, it fits so perfectly into the Bible, the gospel message of mm. 1 John 1 verse 9, where it says, if we confess our sins, yes. mm -hmm. God is faithful and just to forgive, forgive us, us our sins mm -hmm. and to um, cleanse, us. cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes. That's a plea bargain, isn't it? Yes. And so I didn't realize that at the time, you know, I hadn't, hadn't been converted yet, but mm -hmm. um, I was just sort of happy to be off sort of scot-free, if you will. Mm -hmm. But later on, that, when I found Jesus, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit, but I found Jesus, that hit me really hard. First John 1, 9, when I read my Bible for the first time and read, I got to that point, I realized I, that's exactly what the Lord was teaching me in this plea bargain. He says, you plead guilty, 
confess your sins. Mm -hmm. I got a plea bargain for you. Just mm -hmm. plead guilty, mm -hmm. confess, and I'll cleanse you from all un unrighteousness. Mm. I won't even make you spend 45 days on a work release program. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking to myself, well, your situation is so different from so many others who mm -hmm. get so much longer convictions yeah. and longer sentencing terms and you know all of this mass incarceration yeah. that's going on in the black community and stuff yeah. it's it, it's appalling to me and it, it's you know thank god we serve a god who's fair mm. Oh man! Because life here is not. Well, you know, you know it's fair in a, way, <laughs> yeah, in a way, but don't you think it's a little unfair the way we are? Uh, we're actually forgiven and cleansed. Well, that's not yeah. fair, is it? So, you know what? That's true. It, he doesn't treat us as we deserve. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, when you think yeah. of fairness, you think of being treated as you deserve to be. No, yeah. we are not treated as we deserve mm -hmm. to be. Thank God. God, mm -hmm. Christ was treated Praise the way the we Lord. were deserved. That's right. Yeah. So, so that we could be treated the way he deserved. Absolutely. Yes. So I remember sharing this story one time in a church and uh, a lawyer was in the audience mm -hmm. and uh, he came up to me and made me feel kind of bad. He says, you know why uh, they offered you that plea bargain? You know, he was a prosecuting attorney mm -hmm. and he says, it's probably because they didn't have enough evidence on you. And so I'm going, oh, great. So uh, maybe so you could have been free. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You oh, probably could have beat that case. Right. You probably could have beat that case and they were yeah. probably, because that sounds pretty uh, going from 10 years down to 45, why would they, the two years, I didn't like that. Right. I didn't like 10 years, of course, but I didn't right. like two years either, but right. 45 days, I right. could do that. And that's, and that's what they tend to do too, is come in and offer you these plea bargains yeah. mm -hmm. and trump up all these charges and then yeah. say, okay, well, this sounds, you, you'll be like, well, this sounds really mm -hmm. horrible. I better just take this. Yeah. You know, because yes. really, if you were to, if they were to try every case, the judicial system would shut down. There's no That's way they it. could yeah. try every single That's, case mm -hmm. in court. Yeah. So they offer these plea bargains and then people accept them and then so that gets them off the docket. Yeah, they're trying, <laughs> oh, I see. They want to clutter up the court and get us out of there, move <laughs> yeah. along. So how did you find the Lord? Well, Your life that, had obviously spiraled. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. so at this point, uh, um, I have lost my connection with God, really. You know, I'm like, uh, atheist, agnostic. Mm -hmm. I don't believe, I doubt the existence of God at this point. So, uh, the turning point, well, my mom got sick. Mm -hmm. My mom got sick with, with cancer. And before that happened, I had just, uh, I decided, you know, I went out of, the, I forgot the music business. I'm not going to do this music stuff anymore. You know, our, our, we just sort of had bad experiences. I said, mm -hmm. well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and pursue a, a business. And so I started a car business and uh, I got a dealership, I got a dealer's license, you know, mm -hmm. and I got a partner and we started doing cars and a guy came into the, to the office and bought a Volkswagen convertible from me and he, he happened to be a, an intern from Loma Linda University. Mm -hmm. And he invited me to, we became friends, he invited me to come down and live with him. Uh, he had an open room in his apartment down in Southern California mm -hmm. and near Loma Linda. And, uh, and so I did and one day he invited me to a Bible study. It was uh, occurring in the local area. It was in Redlands, California, near Loma Linda. And I thought, well, okay, Bible study. Well, let's go, let's go. Maybe there's some people I can meet, you know, some girls or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll go down there into the Bible study. We got there, the Bible study was so full of people. It was very popular. There must've been a hundred people in this guy's home. Oh, wow. And I never even saw the man presenting the, the Bible study. Uh, so when we got in there, there was people lined up around the edge of the house, all lined up to hear the, to participate in the Bible study. And the only place I could find a set was in the kitchen, uh, up against the refrigerator. And so I squeezed in between two people and I said hello to the one on the right. And I said hello to the one on the left. And I looked back on my left and it was my long lost cousin, Steve, sitting right there. Wow. A man who had, uh, he, he had married my cousin years ago and they got divorced and, and we lost track of him and I hadn't seen him in years. And I called, Steve, what are you doing here? <laughs> And he said, well, oh man, I'm in school at Loma Linda University. He's a physical therapy student. Mm. I said, well, I'm in the car business. And I told him that it's up and down. It's like a roller coaster. You know, you mm -hmm. can make money and then all of a sudden you're losing money. And, and he said, oh, you ought to do what I'm doing. He said, I'm, a, I, I'm going to school. I'm going to be a physical therapist. The pay is good. The job market is wide open. And I thought, well, if he can do it, you know, <laughs> he, he actually talked me into going to physical therapy, into school. And so... I, I went back and I started getting my prerequisites. I met my wife, uh, Mickey. I, she wasn't my wife, but I met her. Uh -huh. and, uh, she was actually um, over at, uh, I, I went over to Steve's house to visit him. He had an apartment and his roommate uh, was there. He had a roommate and she, my, my wife, Mickey-to-be, was over there visiting the roommate one day. And so I came in there and I'm, 
And I was no longer interested in Steve, visiting <laughs> Steve all of a sudden. I wanted to visit Mickey, you know? Mm -hmm. She was beautiful. And I thought, hmm. and, and I found out she was two weeks away from graduating from Loma Linda University. Uh -huh. I thought, wow, that could, that could come in handy, you know? I got a job coming up. She was in dental hygiene in the dental school there. And um, so I found out, and I'm in the car business. So I, I asked Mickey, I was trying to think of things to, to say to her, to, to stir up a conversation. I finally said, well, what are you going to do when you graduate? You've got two weeks to go. What are you going to do? She said, well, I'm going to get a job, and then I'm going to finally buy my first car. And I go, what are you going to buy? She wow. said, well, I'm going to buy a white BMW, a two-door, five-speed with a sunroof, a 325i. And I thought she was joking because right outside of the house, of the apartment, she didn't see me come up, was a white 325i <laughs> BMW convertible five-speed. It was like You're the kidding. most uncanny Wow. thing. It was exactly what she described, the color, the model, almost the, to the mileage. And this you know, was your car? It was in our dealer, dealer inventory, yeah. Oh, I was driving wow. it. I just drove it to, you know. Right. And, I, and, I, and that, so God used that as the catalyst. You know, God just set this up. He saw Steve here, my mm -hmm. cousin, physical therapy, visit him, meet Mickey, and Mickey ended up, we ended up, I ended up giving her the car, and we got married, and, wow. and uh, she helped me go through school. She put me through school, and um, um, and I got loans. I, my dad wouldn't help me at all because I had already let him down before. You know, oh, yeah. he sent me to school at an early age, and I just squandered his whole mm -hmm. tuition and everything. And I was mm -hmm. uh, totally unfocused. So, so I was on my own, and, and it was a real hardship to get through school. You know, the mm -hmm. finances and everything. Um, credit cards. We ended up selling that BMW just before I graduated to pay for part of my tuition, and mm -hmm. we sold everything we had. And my wife scrimped and put us through, and. Um, but around this time, my mother got sick, you know, while I'm in school. And she would ask me to come over and read to her the Bible, the, of all things. You know, I'm not even a follower. I mean, I, I love my mother. So just out of love, she's laying on, in the living room on her sick bed, which turned out to be her deathbed uh, eventually. For two years, she sat in this, this condition. And so she would ask me to come over and sit and just read her spiritual books and the Bible which I would do, you know, I'd read the Bible hour after hour, just read to her whenever I could. And, um, and uh, eventually she passed away. And so that devastated me. Um, I thought she was gonna get well, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't do good with, with uh, death so well, but uh, I thought she was gonna get well, so it was just really a hard thing for me. Mm -hmm. But it was exactly what I needed. I needed to realize my life was Life is terminal, you know, life is actually temporary. You know, yes. when you're young and you're out there trying to pursue your dreams, me, 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 you know, mm -hmm. wealth and, and me and all that stuff, you don't really think about your, your, your life has an ending. You know, there's an mm -hmm. ending. If you don't have God, yeah. there's a, that's a big ending. You know? Right, <laughs> right. A permanent ending. Permanent ending. ending. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. so the Holy Spirit used all that. So one day I'm, I'm in a, an anatomy and physiology class at a public school. I'm getting these prerequisites. One of the prerequisites for getting into physical therapy school was anatomy and physiology. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is the turning point. So here I am. I'm in a huge lecture hall. It's an amphitheater. Uh, Ron, uh, ex drill sergeant, Marine drill sergeant, is the teacher. Mm -hmm. And he's an ex Seventh day Adventist, too. Oh, wow. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing against the church. He just said he didn't have time for religion. You know, he just, mm -hmm. you know, Adventist, that's probably the right, really, that's the true church, he thought. But I don't care. I'm, I'm, you know, he didn't really care about religion. He mm -hmm. was a teacher. He was teaching on cellular mitosis or cell mm -hmm. metabolism was our class and uh, how the cell divides. And mm -hmm. so pencil in hand, paper notes, all the students were um, taking notes and I'm listening to the lecture on how the cell divides and how the, the cell functions. Mm -hmm. And he started explaining all the intricate details of uh, how a cell divides and how the cells, but it's just so complex. Mm -hmm. He says the body has got 10 trillion cells. Now I think they say it's got 100 trillion cells. And each one of the cells has all these things. There's a membrane. There's a cytoplasm inside. There's the lysosomes and the, uh, all these different things, uh, a mm -hmm. nucleus in the middle. There's a DNA molecule. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he was describing and we're studying how the processes work, how this stuff works. And I'm, just, I'm flabbergasted at this point. You know, for a person who doesn't believe in God, this is awfully hard to swallow, you know, because yeah. this is complex. Right. Mm -hmm. It got more intense when he started to describe how, um, what happens when they're dividing. When he started to describe the DNA, we started studying the DNA molecule, the deoxyribonucleic acid. This mm -hmm. is what scientists consider the most complex structure in the universe, the DNA, and you can't even see it. It's a, right. It's a, right. You can see it on an electron microscope, but 
So he's describing the function. What happens in the DNA, he says, this DNA molecule contains the genetic blueprint of how your body is, is designed and formed and how it's going to build. It's, mm -hmm. it's the blueprint, like an architect's blueprint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's 10 trillion of them. Every cell has one. Right. And he says, when they go to divide, well, after all these processes take place, uh, there's a, a nucleus and a blank, sort of a blank DNA molecule in the, new, in the newly formed cell. He says, now, to get that genetic blueprint, the code, into that new one, we have another molecule called the RNA molecule. Mm -hmm. He says, now, what the RNA molecule does is sort of transcribe and, and uh, dictate, or, or it, it takes all the information from the original uh, DNA molecule, and then it goes on a journey. He says, it, tra it transverses through the membrane into the new cell, and it deposits the... Uh, the, 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 the code, the code, the code mm -hmm. into the new DNA molecule, mm -hmm. and I, that's about all I could take. Uh, I put my pen down. <laughs> <laughs> I put my pen down, and I'm like, you know, I'm no longer listening to a, a class on how cells divide or mitosis. I'm listening to a, a, a class on the existence of God. Mm. There's a, no doubt in my mind now. This is no. This is not. Uh, spontaneous, there's no way this coincidence, right. nothing like that. I'm right. going, and the Holy Spirit was just whispering. He said, the Holy Spirit's interesting because he knows exactly when to approach you yes. with this kind of stuff. And yes. he approached me strongly at this point. Mm -hmm. He's saying in my mind, my mind's telling me, there's a God out there. Uh, mm -hmm. and there's no way the, what Ron is describing is, is just mechanical and uh, mm -hmm. happenstance. Right. This is a God with a complex God with a design in mind. Right. And so I put my pen down and I, 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 I didn't take any more notes the rest of the day. And um, I decided right then and there, I want to know this God. There's a, there's, a, there's a God. I'm absolutely sure of that. And he also, the Holy Spirit impressed me where to find this God. Because of reading my Bible, the Bible to my mother mm -hmm. and watching her die, she died with peace. Mm -hmm. She was just at, at peace. Yeah. Never complained. I don't think I've ever heard my mother complain. No. Going through radiation and chemo and pain for two years, not a, not a peep, not a complaint. Maybe I'm thirsty or something like that, but mm -hmm. uh, she died with peace. And then I realized that the reason she had the peace was because she knew her maker. She That's knew this God. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know this God. And so, oh, you got to, and I knew where to find him. It's in the Bible. Right, you know? And so right. I got a Bible, you know, I'm uh -huh. going to go find God. You know, I'm, I was thoroughly committed. I knew it, I was probably going to have to give up things. Mm -hmm. I thought my life was going to be kind of, kind of tough from now on. It's going to be kind of unfun. I'm going to lose all my privileges. <laughs> can't listen to the, whatever. I'm not going to have fun anymore. And, but I decided, even though I wasn't going to have fun in life anymore. I decided I'm going to do it anyway because I'm, I don't want to go to that burning place or whatever, whatever the consequences. I want the eternal life. I want to be with my mother. Mm. And uh, so I decided. And I think that every Christian uh, that's going to end up in a saving relationship with Jesus in heaven has to make that commitment. Don't you yes. think? Yes. That no matter what, make the commitment. Yes. And, uh, because to know I'm, God. To know God. And to pursue knowing God. Without wavering. And, so, and you know what? That... Even that decision comes mm -hmm. from God. It must have. Even that yeah. decision. Because I put my foot down. Him. I put my foot, I'm yeah. going to do it. Yeah. yeah. E even that determination comes from Him. So, so for the viewer who says, well, I, I don't really feel like that, mm -hmm. ask God to help you to feel like that. Oh, absolutely. And let me tell you uh, That's along this line. From. Yeah. Okay, so I get the Bible. Uh, you know, and, and by the way, when I did become a Christian, became committed, I found out I didn't give up anything. I just gained everything. <laughs> That's I realized, right. What was I waiting for? Yes, it's yes. not that bad. It's what, great. I waste so much yeah. time. Yes. Oh, yeah. So here I get the Bible, and I try to read it. And uh, because of my lifestyle and all the things I've been, I couldn't understand what I was reading. You know, the devil had a little bit of control over my thinking. Mm -hmm. wasn't a devil-possessed person or anything, but... Mm -hmm. But the devil, like the parable of Jesus tells about the, the, the seeds that were planted on the wayside and the, and the birds came and snatched them away. The mm -hmm. devil is that snatcher. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading, a, I'll read a text, the devil would just go in and laugh and snatch it out. So I could not contemplate what I was reading. Were you reading in King James Version? Pro I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I would assume so. Mm -hmm. That was a prominent. Mm -hmm. And I love the King James. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. However, you're right. King James can be a little hard to understand. Yeah, for, for those who aren't used to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know. My kids, actually, all my kids learn to read by reading the King James Bible. Yeah. That's got to be supernatural. Yeah. Wow. They learn how to read. You know? They learn reading uh, Well, I would, I would read with them and read, and then pretty soon, it's like uh, riding a bicycle. Pretty soon, the training wheels come out, and then all of a sudden, they're going. It's just like <laughs> they learned it from the, wow. from the Bible. Wow. Right? And so, Great. after my second or third child, I realized, hey, this is how you teach people to read. Mm -hmm. You know, God's going to help. 
But uh, so here I am struggling with my, con my comprehension of what I'm reading and, and I'm, I'm not enjoying this at all. And finally I get to a text like in Philippians 2 verse 5. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a graphic of Philippians 2 5. The Bible says, let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So something finally spoke to me. I realized that I'm struggling with my mind now. Uh, I can't understand what I'm reading. And so I said, hey, wait a minute, let me ask God. If God really does exist, which I know he does, and if salvation is found in the Bible, maybe he could make me like the Bible. Mm. This text here says that we could have the mind of Christ. Well, I'm, if, he, if, if God wants me to like the Bible and wants to be saved, salvation's found there, he might be able to do something about this. And so I got on my knees and I asked God, I said, God, please help me understand what I'm reading. I'm, right now, I'm not enjoying it. I can't understand it. It's, you know, I found myself just, just tasting the Bible. I didn't mm -hmm. like it. I hated it, you know. Mm -hmm. I hated my experience. It was because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I need to find God, you know, and I'm not finding it. And so I said, God, if you want me to like this book, make me like it. Amen. And I didn't expect an answer, really. You know, I've never had big answers to prayer. But as soon as I got up, I opened the book back up and I started reading and instantly, it was like a light switch went on understood everything and I found myself <laughs> wow. liking what I was reading. Yes. I read some more and I read some more and I go, thank you, God. Yes. Mm -hmm. It opened a whole new world for you. It sure did. Mm -hmm. uh, Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, transformed. by renewing, of renewing the, mind. the mind. I read that and I go, God is actually able to make you like the things you should like. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm praying, God, again, make me like what you want me to like. Mm -hmm. He started changing my life, you know? And, yes. and instead of finding the things that I thought would be distasteful, I'm actually, I like Christian music now. You yes. know? I like listening to Elon Lewis on 3 a.m. <laughs> <Praise laughs> and uh, uh, I love all this stuff. And uh -huh. so, so I pray, I recommend, I would say that would be the highlight of my testimony right there, mm -hmm. Philippians 2.5. Make God, ask God to make you like, so if your viewers are having trouble with comp comprehending the Bible or liking things, you think, oh, it's what a burden to like spiritual things. Mm -hmm. Just open your Bibles up, Philippians 2 verse 5, get on your knees and ask God to make you like the things you should like. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee it, he, your money back guarantee, it, <laughs> it doesn't do it. You can have your money back, but God will do a miracle for you. Yes, it's make you good. like. And so now I'm hungry and thirsty. The Bible is just everything to me now. Oh, that's so great. That's yes. so great. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so you went from studying to now teaching too, correct? So that's you, right. You yeah. do seminars and all of that? Well, we travel around mm -hmm. and I do Revelation seminars. Our, uh, our, our Revelation seminar is called um, Revelation 101, a survival training course. And uh, I think we have a graphic we'll of that too. We have a graphic too, of but, that, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, I just like it to travel around, and uh, there it is, a survival training course. And the top, it says, life is temporary. Choose to make it permanent. Mm. And so besides this, these are our, our one month long crusades. Uh, I do a, lot, a number of weekend seminars now, and we do one on a modern day resurrection. We do one on surviving the mark of the beast when you can't buy or sell. Mm. And then um, we do, we have one on uh, what's, what's called Animals and People That Rest on Saturday. Mm. Ah. Yeah, we, we do film production and we did a... a Go ahead, Jay. <laughs> you said a modern day resurrection. What, what is that about? What, that's uh, that's the story of my son. We had, when my family started growing, our third child drowned in a pond one day. Mm. And uh, he, I rescued him out of there, but it was probably about 30 minutes after he'd already been dead. Pulled him out of the pond and, um, and through a series of miracles, uh, God brought him back to life. 30 but minutes after? Probably about 20 to 30 minutes. And it could have been longer. He had time to float out into the middle of this pond, face down. And, oh. uh, and I had just been, it was my day to watch the kids. Mom went to work. Um, we're already living in the country. We moved out of the city. And, uh, but anyway, she was at work. And um, I wasn't watching the kids as closely as I should have been. I mean, I had a real big major fail that day. Yeah. How, uh, how old was he? He's about two and a half. Okay. Yeah. And my, my, my daughter came up to me. Uh, during the day, my afternoon, I was working on my computer, went outside just to check on the kids. My daughter came up to me and very patiently waited her turn while I was dressing a wound on one of the other kids. And she told me that uh, when she got her turn, she mm -hmm. said, Jackson drowned. And I said, why didn't you interrupt me and tell me that a little about 10 minutes ago, you know? <laughs> uh, anyway, I went down and looked everywhere from, we had a pond on our 37 acres and uh, I found, finally went down there and there he was floating oh. face down. I drove in, had my, a little, my little Kennedy, which was just an infant, and I had just dropped her. And I went in there, 
rescued him out. It took a long time to get him out of there. I, I rescued him out. He wasn't breathing. No, no pulse, no breath. You know, I, had, I'm a, I was in the medical field, so I, I assessed his vital signs. There was nothing. Mm-hmm. And he was cold. So, oh, and so, um, I know, I just screamed out to God, I, you know, after sitting there for the longest time, you know, if, if Alex came and I'm going, he's dead, what do we do? How do we tell mom when she comes home, you know, oh, she's at work. Yeah. Well, we had a pretty bad day today, yeah. mom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I yelled at God, I go, God, do something. All I just said was do something, not expecting him to do anything. Mm-hmm. And when I, when I yelled at God to, to do something, which was very irreverent, I guess, but a little bubble came out of his mouth, his nose, he bubbled. Mm-hmm. And a little voice spoke to me and said, now would be a good chi- time to try CPR. A voice actually so, told me, to, now would be a good time to try CPR. And I go, well, I wasn't even thinking CPR. It's cold. This is, a, yeah. this is way past, a, you know. Mm-hmm. But I tried, and I did, uh, I did I, oh, very clumsily, I, I tilted his head back, pinched his nose off, gave him a breath. He, you know, ch- the chest went up, it exhaled, but no inhale. The voice said, keep trying. And I did it again, nothing. I did it a third time. And finally, he inhaled, uh, uh, automatic, in, you know, reflex. He inhaled, and then, then he started moaning and groaning. He started moaning. He came back to life, called 911. Uh, uh, we got him in the ambulance, uh, took him to the nearest hospital, and he was in the, I mean, he was in way worse shape. I, I almost wish I hadn't revived him because he was now just eyes rolled back in the head. He's moaning. Mm-hmm. Every muscle in his body is toned up. He's in horrible condition. Wow. Man. So here, the miracle on that uh, story is basically that he's in the ER room, hospital full of nurses. They're not, they're not getting anywhere. He's, he's, but they, do, they had pumped about two or three gallons of, of water out of his lungs, and they had him on a heater. His core temperature was, was well below a resuscitable level, they, the, ER, the EMTs told me, and, and he was, looks like a permanent, he's permanently brain damaged forever, mm-hmm. badly da- brain damaged. And I've worked with uh, physical in physical therapy, but work with drowning victims, and mm-hmm. they don't, for the most part, get well. They just mm-hmm. we just improve their function a little bit. But he was the worst I've ever seen. <sighs> a voice told me again, "Ask me for another miracle." Mm. And so I went out, and the nurse invited me to go out and change. I changed. I got on my knees and I asked God for another miracle. I said, "What a beautiful miracle! You brought him back to life." Mm-hmm. And he had prompted me to ask for another miracle. So I said, "I don't know what you can do, but..." I'm asking for the miracle. You're asking me to ask for a miracle. I want that miracle. So I went back in the ER room, and here he is laying there. All you know, he's just like curled up. His eyes are rolled back, and he's still moaning. He's groaning. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's so incoherent. I walk back, and I'm not sure how God's going to answer the prayer. So I just looked at him and I said, "Jackson, are you cold?" And I reached out. To, he didn't answer. I reached out and touched him to see if he was cold. Mm-hmm. And as soon as my hand touched his chest, his whole body just relaxed. His his eyes rolled back. He looked. He looked. Turned his head. Looked at me. Wow. And said yes, and he was just completely oh. restored I, by a that touch. Of a that, I'm it, telling you, that just makes me want to cry. You know, I didn't expect that. Wow. Everybody in as the, soon as you touched him, as soon as I touched him, it, it almost scared me. I mean, I touched his his body. You know, not expecting a miracle. I'm not sure what God's going to do. I just, I don't yeah. know. I thought he'd slowly get well. God's yeah, yeah, Help him yeah. out a little bit. Yeah. If anything, but it was a, I was, it was. His whole body relaxed. His whole consciousness came back to him. He looked at me, looked me right in the eye, and answered my question, as if he heard me. And he yeah. said, "Yes." And all the nurses that were in the, you know, in the uh, every one of the hospital nurses in this small town hospital was there, and the doctors were all there, and they, they started cheering. The whole ER, they all started just clapping and and and, and saying, "Praise the Lord!" You know, these uh. these who I don't know if they're Christian or what, but they were <laughs> praising God. Yes. And he was restored from that moment on. And, uh, and you have a book about. That yeah, we, we sure do. We got uh, a book called A Modern Day Resurrection, and that's been a really big uh, a blessing in our lives. Yes, praise mm-hmm. the Lord. It's, it's up on the screen now. Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. A modern Day Resurrection. Modern Day Resurrection. So, and now we have a whole seminar series on just on the, the 12 resurrection stories in the Bible, you know, because they mean so much to me. Yes. And so... Uh, we need your website so that people can contact you. Absolutely. To, um, you know, to get these mm-hmm. books and, yeah. and tapes and all of that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you want that now? Yeah, yeah. give it to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have it for free. <laughs> uh, our website is uh, desiremedia.org, www.desiremedia.org. Um, you can email me, laren at desiremedia.org. Um, we have an 800 number, 800-780-9390. And we're on the road almost constantly, uh, traveling around and um, doing, re- if not Revelation seminars, we're doing weekend seminars. Hmm. 
on yeah. the way back from here, we're stopping and doing another one in Colorado. Nice. And so, you've been having baptisms? and We've been having baptisms. We have, yeah, that comes with our revelation. And uh, praise God for those. Yes. Those are the highlights. And, praise the Lord. and you've yeah. also done a documentary, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's what's circulating currently. And that's what we'll be doing in Colorado this week. And we'll the be talking Seventh about the Seventh-day Beavers. Tell us nice. about that. We have about... Okay, that's a, now, that's, now this happened when we moved out of the country, into the, mm -hmm. out of the city, I mean, into the country. God, God worked on our hearts, said, let's get out of the city and let's move to the country. And we found miracle after miracle. Someone offers a free home. We moved up in the Modoc National Forest. I mean, we really moved to the country. I mean, mm -hmm. it, was, it was beaver country. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm on a Sabbath afternoon walk one day and I come across this big, huge beaver dam. You know, and that to me, to a city guy, that was just... Wow, this is nature. We have arrived. Right. <laughs> we found nature. Yeah. And so I would come back Sabbath after Saturday after Saturday. I'd take these little walks out there, and I'd bring the family, and we'd look at the no beavers. All we would see was the, uh, the, the, the results of their work, the dam, the lodge, huge. I mean, like a six-foot-tall giant lodge or dam there. And um, I, I thought, well, beavers are hard to find, right? But uh, one day I, I went out there on a non-Saturday day. And there they were, just working, just doing things. And I couldn't mm -hmm. believe it. I'm, I got my camera out and I, and I started filming. And I, mm -hmm. and I went back the next Saturday, brought the family, you know, and uh -huh. no beavers. They didn't come out on Saturday. <laughs> and so I remembered back before I had moved out of the city, uh, we, were, we had a, an apartment right next to us where a guy named Bill lived. Bill told me out of the blue one day uh, that he noticed the bees in this orange grove nearby would fly in these, these patterns every day of the week except for Saturday. On Saturdays, they wouldn't fly. And he just told me that out of the blue. Wow. Didn't mean anything to me at the time, uh -huh. but I just realized, well, that's because God's sab must be because God's Sabbath is on Saturday. Right. And so, but it stuck in my mind. And when I came back and I would see them on Wednesday and I'd see them on Sunday, but I wouldn't see them on Saturday. I said, I wonder if these bees or beavers are doing what Bill's bees are doing. Mm. Yeah. So I got the crazy idea to mm -hmm. take my camera out there and do a s observational study. You know, I've learned a little bit about the scientific method. You observe, you collect data. And I said, I'm going to do that. This is an awesome project. The kid's going to help. And so for like the next three years, I'm doing this, this wow. before work, after work. I'm studying yes. this colony of beavers. And we have a trailer, don't we? Don't I, we have a I, yes. little clip yes. from that? Yes. Let's show it. We do. Okay, that would explain the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> It all started when we moved out of the city. We moved way up here, way up to this remote area by the Modoc National Forest. Here, I discovered this really neat beaver colony. I was so excited by this close encounter with nature that I started to film with a video camera. That's when I made a remarkable observation. These beavers were out and about every day of the week, except Saturdays. I was never able to get any pictures on Saturdays. So I decided to do a little study. The incredible results I want to share with you in this documentary I call The Seventh Day Beavers. You know, isn't it amazing how the Creator God created the animals and the insects to even observe the Sabbath? I mean, that's amazing. amazing. They left His print, right? On, yeah, that's on, right. I mean, His imprint of uh, creation. Mm -hmm. You know, we've lost that, haven't we? We've, the, mankind generally has lost the idea that God created us in six days. Oh, yeah. And so, the Sabbath oh, yeah. is a memorial of that event. And, that's right. And uh, I don't, I've only studied this one family of beavers, so I don't know what other beavers do, but mm -hmm. I've heard a number of other stories. In fact, we're, we're hoping to do a follow-up documentary if we can get the funding, and it's called Animals That Rest on Saturday, because we've, oh. we've had a numerous stories coming in. Doctors, neuroscientists gave me a story. So we're flying to Australia to do a program on evolution and creation and in March. It's about, uh, it's called Origins. And nice. It, and oh. it's, um, this beaver story has turned out to be an amazing witnessing tool. It's bringing That's people cool. into the church. Mm -hmm. That's uh, we amazing. Had a, I, went, I did a seminar in Montana just recently, and I met a little boy came up to me, six-year-old boy came up to me, 
started hugging me. And, he, and I, what's going on here? Mom comes up. You know why he's doing that? He says, little um, Jonathan there, he shared your Beaver DVD mm. with this Baptist pastor. And now the Baptist pastor is now an Adventist. He's, he just recently got baptized into mm -hmm. our church because of that video. Because of that video. You know, speaking of little boys, whatever happened to Jackson? Oh, Jackson. Well, he, he recovered. He made a full, full recovery. And uh, now he is, he ended up being the producer for the Seventh-day Beavers. Oh, wow. When he, was a, when he was first born, you know, wow. and this, uh, actually before, uh, this is before he drowned, I had him in the backpack and I would spend hours and hours just observing beavers. Now he's grown up, he's 18 years old. He is the main producer, the technical producer for, he's an amazing talent in our ministry. He's, he's an app developer for Apple. Mm. Uh, he's got the, wow. the what is that? The techie. Techie. Yeah. <laughs> but not yeah. just, he's a super techie. You wow. know what I mean? I mean yes. oh Look at God. That's yeah. Look at God. God. He had a plan for his guy. life. Spared his life. He has an amazing testimony. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yes, Lord is good. indeed, indeed. We thank you for your work mm -hmm. and, and for being with us. Thank well, you so much. Praise God. Well, this thank you for having so me. This was so enlightening. Yes. What a blessing. And you can see that God's still moving. God is an incredible, incredible creator of the universe. Thank you for watching. Tune in next time because it wouldn't be the same without you.